Okay, I'm just going to turn off my camera because I've got this really big glare in front of me, but I'll, I'll, I promise I'm still speaking. It's not been generated by an AI robot. So I'm still here. I'm just going to turn off my camera for a second um, while I do the presentation, but we'll come back and do um, have a chat at the end of it. Yeah. Um, let me just wait, let me stop my video as long as you can hear me. All right. So, yeah, like I said before, thank you for inviting me to present to the Ride the Docs India group. Um, I've never, I'm surprised I've never done this before. Like I've been working with a few people in Ride, with Ride the Docs and also, you know, um, globally, but I've, I've, I i do not know if I've never presented with Ride the Docs India. Like we've had a Ride the Docs India and a Ride the Docs Australia combined conference before, but I've never spoken to the, to the actual community. So here I am. Uh, all right, let's keep going. Um, like Mansi said, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been a technical writer for over 17 years, um, coming up to 18 actually next month. Um, and I currently work as a technical writer with Amazon Web Services Australia. Uh, outside work, I love spending my time reading books and traveling, as you can see from this photo. So if you've um, been to one of the uh, if you've been to Australia, if you've even seen photos of this, is this is Uluru right in the middle of Australia. I, I went there with my dad last year and it was just fantastic. This this whole place is absolutely magical. So if you do get a chance, do visit. Um, and like I said, I like trying out new food and organizing documentation events. So I know it's a bit of a strange mix, but I actually get to combine most of them. So when I'm traveling, I'm organizing something, I'm reading my books on, along the way, I'm trying out new food. Um, and that's 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 pretty much me. And I, I initiated and I run the meetups and the annual conference for Ride the Docs Australia. So in case, if you haven't seen me before, I'll come back on camera later on. I've got a big Ride the Docs Australia t-shirt on, which I pretty much live in most of my um, days. I've got so many of these um, Ride the Docs ones. My, my family actually thinks that I don't have any other clothes to wear. So it's a little bit of a branding, but there, there you go, Ride the Docs. Um, okay. Let's keep going. Right, before I dive in, I'm going to share some anecdotes and a bit of a context of you know how my portfolio has changed over the years. And then we'll come back into the online portfolio side of things. So this, I'll take you all the way back to 2007, which is literally, this is like um, showing off my age here, but this is when I started off as a tech writer and I was relatively new in technical writing. I was interviewing for a job um, as a technical writer with a financial services company in Melbourne. And the interviews went pretty well. And for the last step, so this is, again, 2007. Things have radically changed now, but I'll just start off with there and then I'll share how it's over changed as well a little bit. The interviews went pretty well. And for the last step, the hiring manager asked me to share some work samples, as you would do in any sort of you know technical writing um, interviews. So this is when I bought out my plastic folio of work samples back then. A lot of my work was still, uh, I wouldn't say hard, hard bound or you know, printed um, manuals, but it was still something that you could easily print off as PDF. So it could be procedural guides or something that I've worked on in the past. So I bought out this plastic folio of work samples from my first job and some university projects that I had worked on. And I had them all printed out and um, also sometimes heavily redacted sensitive information. So I was carrying this all around with me with the interviews. So this was 2007. Again, it's a bit of, this is a bit of a timeline. It's like literally looking through like a, you know, a time glass of how things have changed. So if you fast forward now to 2012, so this time around, again, I've done a lot of contract work. So you might think this is a little bit, you know, of an unusual thing that I was interviewing pretty much every year, but I've done a lot of contracting and that's the nature of contracting. So I pretty much was interviewing every six months, 12 months or whatever it might be. But fast forward to 2012, this time I was interviewing again for a technical writing contract, um, for documenting some work instructions and process content for an energy company, you know, in Melbourne again. When it came to sharing my work samples, the size of the portfolio had now shrunk from a hard copied folder. So I was no longer carrying around a file full of, you know, printed material. But I, what I did instead was, you know, I, I carried a CD with me when I went to interviews. Now, a CD had some good things going for it back then. Like you could, you know, people could search for it. They could put it into their CD drives and look for information and examples and browse through different folders. Um, when I finally got that gig, one of the feedback I received was that, you know, my application really stood out because of that CD and no one else had come up with, you know, like a proper set of work samples. 
Now think about it. Like in this day and age, I don't even know. Like you know, half the computers or laptops they don't have a CD drive. A lot of people have never heard of you know. But what what is burning a CD really mean? So I'm again I'm showing off my age a little bit here, but. This is 2012, so not too distant in the past. Like it was still only about 10 or 12 years back, but I, I was carrying a CD around. Now let's jump another five years into 2017. And by then I had considerably cut back on my usage of CDs and potential liabilities because, you know, as things go, some companies don't really like pe people bringing in external stuff like USBs or CDs or what it, it might be. So what I did instead was I created a Google Doc that I could share with my potential employers. So it had a whole bunch of links. And I guess reason being by 2017, a lot of my technical writing samples were also publicly available online. So um, I'm not saying before that they weren't, it's just, you know, sometimes they were behind the login or they were only available to customers. But by 2017, a fair amount of my work was now publicly available. And I could just easily put this link into a document instead of downloading it and putting it into a CD. And it was around that time, 2017, 2018, that I really started thinking about an online portfolio. Okay, now let's jump another three years into the future. So 2020, right at the start of the pandemic, um, I was interviewing with a, a very big software company in, in Australia. And as part of the application process, instead of talking about my previous work. So the interview, I, I still remember that interview. It was pretty unique because instead of them asking me questions, I said, you ask me a question, but instead of an answer, I'll, I'll actually walk you through a scenario where I've done something in the past. And the, the, the reason why I could do that was I was ready with the link to my online portfolio by then 2020. So during the interview, so in addition to your usual behavioral questions, um, I actually walked the interviewers to various different work samples and projects that I'd worked on. As things turned out, unfortunately, and I, I didn't get the role, um, but the feedback that I received was that portfolio made quite an impression and they were really, you know, it was a unique way of actually going through a tech writing interview and talking about my experiences. So that brings me to today's session, which is about online portfolios and what goes into building one. I'm not exactly sure how many of the people here on this um, call today have an online portfolio or they're beginning to think about one or you know they already have something and they're here for ideas or want to actually provide feedback. I'm open, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. Um, we, can, we can go through that at the end of the session. Um, if you're planning to create an online portfolio or are curious, I'll be talking about some concepts on you know, how you could possibly organize your content. What sort of tools do you use to create an online portfolio? How do you lean on the community? And what happens after you've created your portfolio? Now, from experience, I can tell you that a good portfolio can make up for years of experience. You can have 20 years of experience. And I've known people in this, um, you know, in this Australian community, at least, where They've got some terrific experience as a tech writer, but their portfolio doesn't exist. Like not in the format that hiring managers these days or recruiters really want to look at it. So if your portfolio is, is you know, is uninteresting or doesn't sell yourself, guarantee you won't get the job. I'm, I'm not saying the portfolio is only the, the only reason why, but that's one of the very important factors. And this is the truth, I guess, it when it comes to hiring, how do you actually sell yourself? How do you actually, you know, advocate for your skills strongly? And conversely, if you just have a few years of experience, you know, you could only be around in tech writing for the last three or four years. But if you have, you know, an impressive portfolio, you might have a better chance of actually getting closer to securing next round interviews. Okay, I'm just gonna jump back. So this is, we're just gonna go through a few things. Like I said, if you're planning to create one or if you already have an online portfolio, maybe some of these things will resonate with you, but let's go through them in a little bit more detail. Now, this is literally like a 101, like you could probably Google this and you'll find the answer of, you know, what, what is a pretty straightforward definition on an online portfolio? It's an online component. It's it's a mechanism that allows you to put your best foot forward. And the reason why they call it online is in this sense, it could be anything. It, it all depends on how you want to portray yourself. It could be a blog, it could be a website, it could be a video channel, like depending on what sort of work you want to, you know, sell your services with or you want to really market yourself with people have had tiktok um portfolios i mean why not like um 
in a session at the STC summit last year, um, I was presenting there. One of the presenters actually spoke about, you know, how attention spans have really diminished um, across readers and across our customers and how Gen Z is now using YouTube videos or TikTok for more tutorial style information. So you could have, you know, your online portfolio in whatever format you really want to um, put that into. Let's start with the most obvious question then. Do you even need a portfolio? I guess in the current tech climate, it certainly helps give you an edge. Um, and again, I'm talking from an um, from a perspective of maybe you don't have one, you're thinking about one, or maybe you have one, but it hasn't been updated enough, or you, you don't think it has enough information. So let's go through a few points too, you know, about online portfolios. So like I said before, a portfolio is one of the best ways to bring um, together all your collective skills and experience in a central place. It allows you to demonstrate a few things, like how do you actually structure your content? What tools are you comfortable with? And how you work with you know, visual design aspects? And more importantly, that you're also not afraid to show your vulnerabilities. And that's for me, as a, I've, been a, I've been a tech writer for so long. I've, you know, I've been in situations where I was hiring for tech writers. I've been a part of you know, interviewing tech writers. And it's often that, like I'm not only looking at what projects you've worked in the past, like, Tell me, you know, what tools you worked with? What, what did you find hard with the tools? What, how did you go around solving those issues? Or show me your failures, like you failed in a project. So what everyone does in at some point. So how did you actually get over it? So put yourself into that interview issues. Wouldn't you want to see a candidate's previous work to give you an idea of what they bring to the team? It can be beyond tech writing. And this, and again, this is something I've like strongly believed. One of the things we technical writers are notoriously bad is selling or advocating for ourselves. Given every opportunity, we should be, you know, re literally shouting from rooftops about everything we do. Unfortunately, we don't. We just sort of, you know, pigeonhole ourselves into a point where we're just doing our work and moving on to a next project. You could be in a position, obviously, that it's where it is not possible for you to have a portfolio. So, you know, think think about all of your work being heavily regulated or behind a login or a paywall, or maybe you work in a niche industry. And even then, I would still think you could probably have some way of presenting your work if required. Okay. Why online? Let's let's start with, obviously, we've spoken about portfolios now. Why would you want it online? A good chunk of the content that we now create is mostly available online. It could be, you know, user guides or API documentation or user manuals or blogs or videos. Even if your work is behind a login or is confidential, I'm sure you can take permissions to screenshot some of this and redact some of the confidential information. I'm pretty sure that's that, that should be doable. Now, rather than reinventing the wheel, and remember, I put myself, you know, in my own shoes in 2007 with all the work that's available online, why would I actually print them off? Like, you know, why would I actually put it on a CD? Like it just making it online just, you know, allows us to use this opportunity to play with and create something that we, we really like, like an online component. Now, for example, I was familiar with a docs as code methodology. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are on this call. I, I would assume a lot of you would have heard of docs as code. Um, I just thought this was a perfect opportunity to create a website, you know, using the same tools that I use at work. Now, tech writing as a profession is, it can be often cut and dry. Like, you know, you can, you're just writing pretty technical stuff and you don't really get to do a lot of creative stuff around it. In fact, you know, in tech writing, that's often forbidden. Like you don't want a lot of fluff or, you know, flowery language. It is just, you know, provide the instructions, get customers, get your users, perform a task, um, you know, within a respectable amount of time. So this, when you're creating an online portfolio, this is also an excellent opportunity to flex some of that creative muscles. You can use your writing skills to craft a story around your work. We usually don't get to do that. Like we have the context and we provide the instructions most of the times. And some of the obvious benefits of having the portfolio online is that, you know, the very nature of interviewing and recruiting has changed over the years. So it, it is absolutely possible. And I've actually been in these situations myself that the employees actually requested my work samples as the very first step in the interview, even before your first interview. So literally I've applied for a role, a recruiter said, yeah, we are happy to set up a call. Can you just send us some of your previous work? 
Um, and, you know, they start off from there and it, it just depends on how their process is structured. It might also be possible that the first touch point that they have with your um, portfolio could be through a mobile device. So what are you going to do if you have all your uh, stuff printed off and, you know, on a CD, how they're going to actually access it? So think about all those things. Again, like I said, it is a lot easier to point someone to a URL than lugging around sleeves full of, you know, printed samples and everything. And it's also not easy. It's a lot, uh, uh, sorry, it is also a lot easy to maintain an online site. Um, and I'll do a quick demo at the end of it. I've actually um, just added something to my portfolio last night, but I forgot to add another bit on my homepage. So I'll actually show you how quick and easy it is to actually add something and publish it online. And like I said, does anyone anyone even burn CDs anymore? I can, you know, I can quickly update my site from anywhere that I have access to a PC and the internet or even a mobile device. And thirdly, it does not make sense to present your online work as printed copies. That, yeah, that sort of defeats the purpose. Having your samples online obviously is an excellent way to show your skills rather than having to explain everything. So like I said, this is exactly the whole title of this whole presentation show. Don't just tell, show me what you've done before. Now, this question came up quite a few times. I've actually done this talk in various formats at various events. And one of the questions a couple of people, uh, students from university had were, what if you don't really have a lot of tech writing experience? Like I'm just starting out as a tech writer. I don't even have my first tech writing job. What would I put into a portfolio then? Um, and my advice to them was you could approach this in a couple of ways. There are a lot of open source projects that often require documentation and some sort of, you know, strategy around it. So that is something you could look to, you know, look into to build to, to have some experience working with remote teams. And you can put that in the portfolio. Alternatively, you can look at creating mock samples for a tutorial. So it doesn't always have to be like a real use case. You could just take a concept from the internet and, create some mock samples or a small user guide, something that demonstrates how you actually approach the subject, how you structure and organize your documentation. Because end of the day, as a hirer or as a recruiter, what I'm trying to look for is, do you actually, can you, do you actually know how to, you know, gather that information, put it into a presentable format? Is it clear enough to you? Does it solve a, a, a real life issue or some sort of a problem? or a task at hand, and that's what tech writing is all about. It's just those different components around structuring, how clear your language is, how do you actually make it more appealing and accessible. Having said that, let's go into a, let's touch a bit on what actually goes in the portfolio, but it's really up to you. Like it's everyone's different. Everyone, you know, wants to show a particular side of their persona um, in a portfolio and that's perfectly ideal. So that's why I've got this as with a caveat saying, this is what should go in your portfolio, ideally. I, I imagined when I did my portfolio as you know something that I was going to showcase with my technical writing, my documentation, and docs adjacent skills. So things like you know facilitating or presenting at conferences or anything like you know I've written blogs, I've been on a couple of podcasts. So I just wanted to include everything around my professional side of things into a portfolio but you can include whatever you feel like appropriate for your site. Generally though, and if I was to put on my hiring manager or recruiter hat, these are sort of things I would, I would expect to see on a portfolio. So all your contact stuff, so things like you know your socials, your experience, your education, which is similar to a resume, I guess, but you can, with, with online, you can, you have the liberty to put in a little bit more detail. With a resume, it's usually, you have to, you know, cut it down to two or three pages, but in an online page, you can it can be an endless scroll, really. More importantly, highlight some of your best work, how you made an impact. So include, you know, relevant links and screenshots, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later in the presentation. And this third thing is the most important. Like, the, again, it's a very personal object, you know, perspective of looking at people's portfolios. Share a little about your failures and how you learn from them. Make you know, that makes for some really interesting conversations at interviews. When I did this portfolio thing with the with the interview that I had in 2020, they actually were more curious to find out, oh, you, you've said you've worked on this really complex and a tricky project in the past. So how did you approach this? They actually wanted to know more about the, you know, this thing failed. How did you actually get over it? What did you do to rectify it? Did you achieve something at the end of it? 
it makes for really interesting conversations. You don't have to overdo it though. You don't have to write, you know, everything. You don't have to go on a rant with, you know, the tools didn't work. The project manager was, you didn't understand my requirements. You don't have to go into that sort of detail. It's more about, these were things I encountered at the end of, you know, a particular project. These were my failures and how did I actually get over them? Include that in your portfolio. Uh, let's jump into tools a little bit. Uh, again, I'm not going to, you know, be very direct about these are the tools you have to use. It's again up to you what your comfort levels are. What do you want to experiment with? Ideally, you would want to use something you're familiar or comfortable with, just so that it makes it easy to keep it updated all the time. Um, let's start off with the more obvious one. Again, you wouldn't think you would have a portfolio there, but I've seen some, you know, writers and people who have like a strong social media side of presence. Like they use LinkedIn very heavily with with some of their work samples. Um, and I would probably term this more of a light or a very MVP version of the portfolio. You can use LinkedIn or YouTube or Facebook, depending on what's the nature of work you've done in the past. So maybe you've done a whole heap of YouTube videos and you can actually create like a playlist out of them or something. Um, given that these are very highly visual media though, you might have to spend quite a bit of time trying to learn how to make it look the best. Like what differentiates a good video from a bad video? So you really have to be on you know, top of things with when it comes to visual media. Regardless of what tools you use though, make sure that your work is accessible. Make sure that people don't have actually troubles understanding the language or, you know, what are you trying to explain and make it, you know, sharp and um, really, um, you know, just to the point where people understand, okay, so this is the kind of work you've done in the past. This is a little bit more, I guess, technical, technical in the sense that if you've got experience working with very niche or specific help authoring tools, like, you know, Madcap or RoboHelp, um, you can use these to create HTML5 outputs that includes your work samples. If you're a fan of, you know, more wiki style information, you can use something like Confluence. There's nothing wrong with this approach at all. What I found though is you might have to invest in, you know, hosting and managing the content online, but it is pretty straightforward. It's a pretty straightforward way to build a portfolio. I mean, after all, you're familiar with the tools and how you can best use them to demonstrate your work. So think about them. You, you, if you use that at daily at your workplace, you, you know, you've already know half the stuff. You just have to create a separate site or a project and then just roll with it. Uh, you could use something like WordPress or Wix to build your own websites as portfolios. So VisiWig apps, what you see is what you get. They have an amazing range of professional themes already built into them that you can you know, use straight out of the box. Like you don't have to really think or labor too much on how is this going to look. They already have all the themes populated. All you have to do is go and populate the content. A lot of these apps and websites also you know, have access to good web hosting capabilities. So you can actually host your content and share it pretty quickly. I found I find a lot of people do that. Like they usually start off with a WordPress site or a, you know, or a Canva site or Squarespace uh, space, and they just, they just go with it. And lastly, if you're, you know, if you're more angling at, you know, developer sort of focus uh, roles or technical roles, the best place to post your portfolio is using the same tools developers are familiar with, or at least, you know, people in the software industry are familiar with. I, again, this is very you know software focused, but I, I would assume something like this would ap apply equally across all, all sorts of technical writing. So in my case, what I decided to do was I used this opportunity, and this is again uh, about six or seven years back. Um, I started to learn and pick up and polish some of my skills working on a documentation tool chain that allowed me to you know understand how docs as code works because I'd seen developers do it for code all the time. So I'm like, we can use the same thing for docs. And uh, we we ended up doing that at the workplace, but I said, hey, how good is this? I can just use the same thing for my uh, portfolio. And it gave me an opportunity to explore static site generators as well. Again, I'll be talking about them a little bit in the in the talk. Um, at work, you might already be using this, so but an online portfolio is obviously your own opportunity to play around. So you don't have to, you know, wait for developers to approve to get get your prs approved and stuff like that so you can just roll with it it's your own side you know go nuts um so here's what's involved in my portfolio we're now sort of moving from the more theoretical stuff a little bit into you know what my portfolio tool chain look like to build my portfolio i use you know obviously visual studio code as my authoring environment i use git for managing the version control side of my content 
uh, I use Yugo, which is a static site generator to build my actual um, site. Uh, and it's also, I've also used one of the existing Yugo templates that, that work really nicely for me. Um, and with, with the Git ones, obviously I use GitHub repos for storing the code and the outputs and also GitHub pages to publish. So it's pretty much a, a very simple um, tool chain and it's all you know driven largely by GitHub because I can store content there. So I just use tools are, that work really nicely with it. If you're not familiar with any of this, that's fine. We'll just look at them a little bit in more detail. So you would probably would have seen at some point uh, how you know we're familiar with this sort of a Visual Studio code. It's an um, authoring environment. If you work in a software development environment or with programmers, I personally use it. I really like it. I use it to author my content in GitHub flavored Markdown. Um, there are other ways you can do Markdown, but I just prefer this because it's like I said, I built my portfolio site around GitHub. So I just use the Markdown and just, you know, tools that really work seamlessly with, with GitHub. Now here's a bonus tip. If you show proficiency in these developer tools, it allows you to earn instant respect with the developers. So when I, I clearly remember, I was working with Madcap Flare um, when I started building my my uh, online portfolio. And when I actually did it, I actually showed it to some of the developers at my workplace and they were like, oh, we didn't know you could, you knew you know how to work in Git and GitHub and with, with Docs' code. I'm like, hey, what do you know? Well, I'm a tech writer, I get to learn stuff. So, you know, it's it allows you to earn that instant respect and the companies that have a sev that are heavily software focused because I, I, I would assume a lot of software firms now use some variation of this tool chain. Uh, moving on to the Yugo side of things, it's like I said before, it's a static site generator, which means it allows, it converts all the content that I create in Markdown files, the, the previous slide that I showed you, into a beautiful looking website. And you can preview this on your local computer. That's the beauty of it. You don't have to go, you know, it's it's got a nice preview um, functionality built within it. So I can actually preview my changes before I actually publish it or host it. Um, which which is which I find is great. Like I, I can actually see what it's going to look like before I actually publish it. Again, you don't have to go with Hugo. You can use something like Gatsby or Jekyll for this. They do pretty similar stuff. Um, so just look for static site generators and Jamstack if you're interested. Now, the reason I picked up Hugo was because I found this theme online, which is just called Eddie's Web Resume Hugo theme, which I think was really worked well for me. It's like a kind of an endless scroll. It's just a one page scrolling sort of a thing. And I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. Um, personally, I like that it's very clean and it's got that scrolling page design. Like it, I don't have to worry too much about, you know, um, the side navigation and the top navigation and the right side of the page or whatever. It's just one single scroll. And I just find it's very easy to nav navigate through. Um, I store my documentation, the actual code and the content as code in GitHub repositories. Like I said, I have built the whole thing around, sorry, I just built the whole thing around GitHub. So there are actually two repositories. One of them is an actual clone of the Yugo theme. And the second is the one that contains my portfolio output file. So if you're interested, um, look look up Git submodules on why and how this is set up in this fashion. Like you've got, if you, if you have a look at this, it's got this, um, the Swapnil um, repository. And then there's also this, another one called Swapnil Ogle.github, which is an actual repository in itself, which creates, which has all the outputs for my uh, portfolio. Once the content is created, stored and ready to go, um, I just use GitHub pages to publish my portfolio site. Now this is only one of the ways you can publish your site, not, not it's, it's only one of the ways you can possibly, you know, uh, publish your site, but you can use any other publishing mechanism. I just use GitHub pages because again, like I said, it integrates really well with GitHub. You can use, you can host it on anything else. You could host it on, you know, Amplify, AWS Amplify or Netlify, whatever it might be. You don't have to use GitHub pages. And the end result is this. This is the homepage of my own personal uh, portfolio. Uh, and I'll provide links at the end of this presentation so you can go in you know, clone it if you need to. I'm, I'm happy with that because I cloned it myself from Eddie Web. So um, yeah, uh, once I was satisfied with this thing locally, I could just, you know, I can just publicly host it on GitHub pages. So that's the tech side of things. Um, I'm just gonna jump back into the why or the organizational part of it. 
I just want to have a look at the time. I think we are we're good on time, Mansi. I think we are. Yeah, we should be okay. We're good. Yeah. All right. So let's look at some um ways of, you know, if you were a hiring manager looking at someone's online portfolio, what would you expect to find? Like what how would you go looking at relevant work samples? Again, it's more of a question for myself every time I ask, you know, when I started creating it. And even now when I look at my own portfolio. It just what am I what what would the hiring manager look for? So creating an online portfolio, like I said before, is an excellent opportunity to use other things, docs, adjacent things, or content strategy concepts, things like you know, think about information architecture, think about navigation, think about relevance and a structure to demonstrate your skills. So it's the content is the one part of it, it's just all these other things. Let's look at some common ways now to structure and organize your portfolio. I'm not going to touch on what goes in your portfolio specifically, like every single page, because it, like I said before, it's really up to you. What, what you want to put on your portfolio is your, and pardon the language, it's your own goddamn business. Like no one has a right way to um, to put present a portfolio. It is, it is what it is. That's the way you want to portray yourself. Um, personally, I also like seeing portfolios that talk about other things. Like, you know, if you volunteered at a docs event or even, you know, non-docs event, always doesn't have to be a docs event. You can, you volunteered within your organization to, you know, lead a workshop or you worked on open source projects before you've blogged or you've done some other community activities. Put all of that in, like a good hiring manager should acknowledge and appreciate, should appreciate all of this. It, it, it is a part of your, you know, professional um, accomplishment that you actually put that on your portfolio. So one logical way, and I, I guess a lot of you here would be in tech writers, you you would identify with some of this. There's one logical way to group your content is by a particular theme or an industry or a domain. So if you've only worked across software, maybe you know, think about an industry or a, a, a particular sort of customer or some sort of, you know. Um, domain that you've worked on. But if you've worked across different um, areas like hardware or mining or something, you can put them in um, in that fashion too. For example, you can organize your content by what you contributed versus what you created. Now, I find this is a very you know important distinction because as tech writers, we often don't write everything from scratch. Like sometimes we do, yes, but sometimes someone else has written that first draft. You've just sort of polished it. You've made it a little bit more final and, you know, helped deploy that particular uh, piece of content. So that becomes more like a contribution piece in my, in my regard. But with the creation is you've started everything from scratch and you've taken it all the way down to, you know, being published. So that's an important um, distinction. This helps interviewers understand the context of your work, which is perhaps more relevant for junior tech writers, I guess, because there's a lot of writing that needs to be done um, from scratch, which really helps uh, hiring managers understand, okay, so this is where you started off. This is how you went about it. Or you could group your content by the work that you've done as a business analyst versus a writer. So this is more like a job title thing. So. Um, job titles are funny in my opinion. Um, you could have worked as a tech writer. You could have worked as you know anything else, but you're still doing documentation. You could you can break down your work in that fashion. So, um, or maybe you've done it by an individual contributor versus a team lead or a manager. So there's slightly you know there are slight nuances with with the kind of content that you create as a team lead or a manager as opposed to a contributor. Another way to organize content is also by specific industry types. Like I said, with, with if you've worked across software, fintech, telecommunications, mining, government. So I've worked across some of them. So my portfolio, sorry, my portfolio has work samples from every, you know, small little things that I've done across different industries. So with my uh, portfolio, I've structured the overall navigation like a resume. Like this is my homepage for my um portfolio and you'll see sections like you know experience skills education so that's one way i've organized that information um and that's on a very sort of a broad level i'll break it down a little bit more further but overall it looks like it's a resume but you can see if, if someone lands on the home page they know exactly what they're looking for if they're looking for my open source contributions they know where to look for it if they're looking at my past experience they'll know which tab to click on the left so this pretty much is my theme of the portfolio um, the next way of, you know, structuring your content or organizing your content, a lot of online portfolio 
sorry, your portfolios would generally have this as their central structure. So documentation or content group by deliverable types. So things like user guides, API documentation, videos, blog posts, process policy, policy documentation could be something else. Um, you know, it could be readmes, it could be release notes. Um, so you, you would want to group it by that. If you're looking to hire someone for a specific role, this structure really makes it easier to search for relevant work samples. So let's say I'm, I'm a recruiting manager, I'm a team lead for a tech writing team. I want people who, who've got you know, API documentation because I'm working on an API project. And I also want someone who can do release notes. So I'm gonna look at their previous experiences working with similar projects. So that's one way of you know, organizing your content on the portfolio. With, with my portfolio, again, this is what I've done. After the homepage, it's sort of, you know, when you jump on a specific page like projects, I've further broken it down based on deliverable or content types. So things like blogs, developer docs, process documentation, and so on and so forth. Now, like I said before, these deliverables really make it easy for recruiters to find my work relevant to the role that they're hiring for. So it's also saving them time. They don't have to go look for, you know, product marketing blogs because they don't think this role will require someone with a product marketing experience, but that's what I did. And if they want to jump in and find out what I did, they can do that. A large number of tech writing interviews, you would have seen, you know, um, they expect applicants to provide answers in a star format. So star stands for situation, task, action, and result. It's a very common method. It's not the only method. There are other ways, you know, people get, you know, uh, complete as part of an interview, but this is one of a very common format. Like they expect you to provide, at Amazon, it's, you know, it's pretty strong on this star sort of format. Like give me the situation, tell me what tasks were involved, what actions did you take and the end result of this. I find this is a very effective way to organizing content on the portfolio as well, because you know it explicitly lists out how you were involved with either creating or contributing to a project and what impact it had overall. So if you've got, you know, if you it allows you to document how you solve different documentation challenges um, and something that is worth recording for senior and lead roles as well. Like it's not just one thing, you've only done API documentation for five years, that's fine. Like when you solve a different documentation challenge, how did you go about doing that? The best thing is if you've got metrics or any additional feedback, it doesn't always have to be data. It could be anecdotes, like someone, a customer's actually sent you a, I remember when I published release notes for my software company way back, eight years back, that, that was the first online release notes that I ever did. And when I sent it out, my manager was a little bit skeptic. He was like, oh, no one really reads the release notes. I said, that's fine. At least it's been converted from a PDF format to online. You know, that's an improvement in itself. It just, ma I've made the process a little bit easier. And the, the, the CEO of the company, it was a pretty so small software company. So they actually got back to me and they said, I, I can't believe this. We've had this customer with us for the last 15 years. They've never reached out to us other than, you know, when we are signing contracts and stuff. They've actually replied back saying, who's created these new release notes? Because that's just, they've just made our whole lives easier. We just know exactly what's coming in your new version. So those are the things of kind of anecdotes you can include in your uh, portfolio. Again, remember it's your own goddamn site. So you can put in whatever you want, as long as you know it's verifiable. If you drill down further on each specific deliverable in my portfolio, that's as, this is what I've done. I've used the star method to document the context, the problem, my contribution to the whole you know, project and the overall impact. And this has helped me document how I work and I'd also highlight additional skills that I bring to the role. Because you know what, very often new places, they've got little to no idea. Like, and again, this is more from an Australian perspective. I know things could be a little bit different in you know a very tech heavy place like India, but in Australia, there are still so many software companies that I've worked for who've got no understanding what technical writers do. So it just provides them that, you know, they can actually, this allows them to understand the skills and competencies better. So it's not just one thing that technical writers do. We, we're planning, we're, col we're not collaborating, we're editing stuff, we're assisting developers with documenting user interface tech. So it's, it's a whole range of different things that technical writers do. And that's what I've used. I've used, I've broken down my individual pages by the context, um, opportunity or the, you know, the, the task that was required, the, the contribution, which is the actions that I took, the deliverables and the impact of the whole thing. 
Now, let's imagine, I'm just going to switch track here again a little bit. I, I realize we might be running short on time, but let's go through this. Um, let's imagine you have your portfolio all ready to go. So I've spoken about, you know, how you've organized content, what sort of tools you've used, and um, what have you got on your portfolio. Before you share your portfolio with the world, wouldn't it be nice to get a different pair of eyes on your work, like someone who's got no idea of what you do? Um, my family still struggles to know what, you know, what I really do as a tech writer. So someone in a very managerial role, maybe, or someone who's your peer in the industry or someone, you know, who is sort of intimately involved with the recruitment process. They've got no ideas of what tech writers do, but they're in the recruitment business. They can provide direction. And this is where the power of a community comes in. If you have a network, you, or you've met folks today, you know, who are happy to help reach out like you know you could have someone in your network who are like oh i really don't know what you do perfect can i actually share my portfolio link with you and get get your feedback on does it allow you to then you know understand what i do and then come back and tell me oh, okay now i know what sort of work you do what industries you've worked on what sort of challenges you face i've got a better understanding yeah that's that's where that power of community comes in personally the this is what I did when I created this portfolio way back in 2018, 2019. I reached out to a few folks in the tech writing community to just, you know, I just said, just be brutal with this. I've just uh, got a new portfolio up and running. Um, I haven't actually publicized it yet, um, but it's all there. It's all online. Can you just review it and get, you know, provide me feedback from, right? And, and it could be anything. It could be content, presentation, structure, design, anything. You want to know what sort of feedback I receive, and then the, again, this is just you know people across different parts of my network. My reviewers picked up on a few inconsistencies, so gave me feedback on the structure and overall presentation, and provided comments on missing elements or things like you know. Um, I liked how your portfolio is structured, but check out the layout, how how it looks on mobile, and use make sure you use the Oxford comma consistently. On, um, you know, there's also another comment about, I love that you've got content samples tagged, which makes it easier to, you know, actually find out what I want to view. As tech writers, we do this all the time. We review each other's work. So this is a great way to help other fellow writers. And this feedback really helped me shape my portfolio in a way that works, you know, 80% of the time. Sure, there might be still people who would think, you know, this could be structured better. This could have a better design or a different color or a font. That's fine. I'll take your feedback on board. But like I said, it's your own goddamn business. This is my portfolio. I want it like this. This There's a reason why I went with this color scheme because I find it appealing. So much like our documentation, it should address most of the needs of the audience. But if not, you know, if not helping everyone, that's fine. As long as you've got the content clearly there, you've got everything for people to know about you before they hire you. I think that's that's doing the job. And again, this is the last, probably the last part of it. It's all good having an online portfolio and everything, but it's of no use if you don't really promote it. Like I've said before, tech writers are notoriously bad at promoting or advocating for ourselves. So use this opportunity to promote your portfolio. It doesn't always have to come up during interviews. You know, Share it around in, in LinkedIn or Slack. Slack it to your programmer saying, oh, I've got this online portfolio. What do you think? Just you know, give me some honest feedback. There are many writers out there who could use that inspiration. You know, it could be the tool chains that you, the tool chain you use because they are maybe, you know, struggling with the same tools um, or the way you organize content. They're like, oh yeah, I've, I think I did a good job, but looking at this other portfolio, I think I could actually improve my own portfolio a little bit. Or even how you designed your site. So use every opportunity to talk about it. So I'm not sure if you uh, know about Amruta Ranade. She's a senior tech writer based in New York. She actually reviewed my portfolio on her tech writing YouTube channel. She was doing a couple of years back, which has actually led me to a few people, led to a few people actually reaching out to find out, you know, what sort of technology did I use or how did I create my portfolio? Because they were do they were, you know, probably running into the same issues. And that sort of, you know, a lot, subsequently led to this session today with Write the Docs India, because I've this is the third time I'm actually talking about online portfolios. I've presented at the Techcom NZ in um, New Zealand a couple of years back. I've done the same thing with STC Summit and STC Chicago earlier this year. So talk about your portfolios. People want to know. People want to know what, what have we been working on, um, you know, how have we been been doing it how are you organizing your content what sort of tools are you using talk tell your story i even blogged about this this allowed me to your know, blog essentially was just a way to capture all my thoughts and experiences so 
Um, it's just also, you know, it's also getting new clients as a contractor. So again, I'm not a contractor anymore, but when I was used to be a contractor, and this is a true story. I remember for a particular project a few years back, a client actually reached out to me after reading some of my blogs and they asked me to collaborate on this documentation project. So I asked them, do you want to like, you know, interview or look at my samples or something? And they're like, no, we're already aware of what tools and processes you've been using. Like I, they said, I read some of your blogs on Madcap Flare um, and, you know, the stuff that you've been doing and they were comfortable with it. They're like, yeah, that's fine. It was win-win from the start. He didn't even interview me for the gig. He's like, I'm just, I've got this project. Are you interested? Let's, let's run with it. That's what I mean. You have to make sure you promote and advocate for yourself. Um, it's while it's good to have an online portfolio, it's also critical to keep, you know, maintaining it over time. And this is where that, you know, that's, that's the, the thing that sort of creeps into a lot of our subconscious is, is that's fine. You have got a portfolio, but it hasn't actually been updated for a few years now. Putting off this task in definitely makes it a bit more challenging. Like old projects are often poorly documented. And human memory, as you would know, is you know notoriously limited. So the closer you are to documenting something, the more accurate it is. So make sure you use that. Incomplete or any less persuasive content will only real, you know, result in low co quality portfolio. So while you've got a portfolio up and running, does it actually serve the purpose? Is it giving me enough of a backstory? Is it telling me what situation you worked on? What you know? What sort of tools have you worked on? What sort of challenges you face? So make sure you document it, and also poor job prospects. They're like, yeah, that's fine. You've got a portfolio, but it doesn't tell me anything. How do you go about maintaining it then in that way? So it can be tough. I I agree. I found it a little bit tough too. Like you you get pulled into you know your daily jobs and stuff like that. But how often do you actually get to update it? So what? And this is something again. Don't take this as gospel. This is something I use myself. You could have a different cadence to your own thing. So freelancers or contractors, for example, they have to look for you know new clients and customers quite frequently. So they might have to update their portfolios more often than someone who you know works in a company on a permanent basis. But that shouldn't stop you. Like you know, here are some tips that you can use to maintain your portfolio, and this is what I generally follow. This is my rule of thumb. It could be different to use. So schedule time every quarter to look back retrospectively on what you've achieved or delivered. Maybe you haven't done something. That's fine. Just move on. You don't have to update anything. Or maybe you've learned something and added to your portfolio. Maybe there's a project that came back from last year into this year. Um, and you've got a little bit more story to tell now. So you just update it. It doesn't take long. Along with keeping your portfolio updated, it's also important to keep it relevant. Like, you know, similar to your resume, like we... The hires really want to see very nice and crisp resumes all the time. So move your content up and down in your work samples, you know, um, just match job requirements. If you're applying for jobs, just make sure you've got all your relevant content at the top and using things like Docs code tooling, it actually allows you to move, you know, a, a, a sort of assign weightages to your pages. So the more important stuff gets moved around at the top. So it's just easier to surface the more relevant ones at the top of the list for for a quicker sort of a finding for recruiters. I use tags as well in the in my portfolio to highlight specific samples. So people, when they click on a tag, everything that I've tagged with a similar sort of a theme gets pulled into a page. So it just makes people read everything you know, assigned to a particular tag. And lastly, do not fear to remove content that is old and not relevant like from your portfolio to keep it clean, keep it searchable. It's like a documentation site end of the day. Do you really need a link to a blog post that you wrote, you know, 12 years back? If it's relevant, yes, keep it. If not, just take it out. Like it, if it's not relevant, just let it go. So yeah, again, I'm going to wrap up here. There are three things you can take away from this presentation today. Let it be this. Depending on the tools and the structure you use, make sure you keep it simple, whatever it might be. Start off with something you're familiar with and allows you to show your best self. Show your authenticity and personality through a portfolio. Like I said, it's again my part in my language. It's no one else's goddamn business. It's your own. Like you know, you can you have the full right to actually design the portfolio the way you want it. What do you want to put on the on your own personal side? Secondly, like a lot of technical documentation, a portfolio is never hundred percent complete. Like you know, with tech writing too, there's there's new features being rolled out. There are new release notes. There might be new API endpoints. So there will be numerous instances where you will be adding to or updating your site. So ongoing maintenance 
should also figure in your plans if you wish to keep maintaining an online version. Otherwise, you know, it might just might as well just be a landing page, to be honest. Like you have to keep spend a little bit more time, put in a little bit more effort to keep it relevant and updated. And lastly, do not forget to talk about your portfolio at every opportunity you get or inspire others and make an impression. So use that. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's the um, references that I've got. Uh, and I'll we'll share this at the end of the talk. Mansi, if that's okay, I'll put these um, put send you the PowerPoint slides as well. So you should be okay with this. Um, I'm gonna go into questions. This is me actually talking about my portfolio a couple of years back. I don't know if you've got time to quickly update the page. I could do that, but if not, I've got a pre-recorded video that I can send along with my slides as well, but I'm happy to take more questions. Sure, um, I'll just open the floor. Uh, if you have any questions, please type it in the chat. In the meantime, I have a question of my own. Um, I often um, get into um, uh, doing UX copy work yep. and as you know, it's something that I cannot share openly. So have you seen anything or you have any recommendation about uh, sharing stuff like that? Um. So when you say you can't share it in the sense that it's not publicly available, or is it just something that they don't ad advertise you uh, putting it on an online site somewhere? Yeah, it's, it's not publicly available. It's a UX copy. So it's mostly about the interface and stuff like that. So I cannot just share it publicly. Okay, can you can you take screenshots and redact some of that, or or can you work on a similar product and use that as an example? Because I've seen people do that, like as opposed to doing a like you know putting it online um, where it's not allowed, you can actually use a, a different um, product and just do something similar, like just fudge some copy similar sort of you know words or text on the field and then just do like a before and after i think that works as long as they can find out you know what you've done okay because um i was also talking to uh one of my uh, ux designers 